We will start in four minutes. We will start in two minutes. Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us for this inaugural session of the 2020 virtual Rowan Coaches Conference. By way of land acknowledgement, as we come together for this conference, geograph geographically dispersed, but brought together virtually, let's take a few minutes to reflect on the meaning of places and in so doing, recognize the territories of the different indigenous peoples of where we live, and where we are participating in this conference today. These lands are home to diverse populations of indigenous and other peoples. We acknowledge and respect the continued connections with the past, present and future and our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within our, within our communities. My, my name is Peter Cookson from Amp Rowing and I'm truly excited today to be your moderator and host for what I believe will be an exciting session on the practicalities of competing at coaching for and running a beach sprint event. I'd like to thank our partners for this event, Row Ontario, Rowing Canada, Aviron, and financial support from the Coaches Association of Ontario. We're gonna start with a few housekeeping items. I'd ask you as participants to, uh, to keep your microphones muted and your cameras disabled. That will just allow for a 
better presentation. Um, the slides are available in OneDrive in case you, for some reason, um, have trouble seeing the presentation. You can access these slides that were sent to you and your email with the link to this. Um, they are in the OneDrive. I would ask you, ask if you have any technical issues, use the chat feature or email andrea at rowontario.ca for any issues that come up. We do, we do encourage questions and we will try to get to all of your questions during the, uh, the, the question part of the presentation. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we, we may not be able to get um, to all of them, but we will do our best to um, answer all of the questions that come up. If, if we do not get to your questions, um, the panelists will be available for questions through email uh, and hopefully we can answer them uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we're going to watch first. Um, oh, just a reminder also, this will be recorded and made available um, after the conference. So you will be able to have a chance to uh, review it again after the conference if you so wish. We're going to start with a quick video. Um, and during this video, um, I would just ask you to um, turn up your volume because it is difficult to hear the volume on it, but it's just an introduction to, uh, to um, beach sprint rowing. So we'll just try to get to that. Hopefully this will work. It might take a bit for it to come up, but in the interim, I'd like to introduce our, our, our presenters for today. We have Bill Donegan with us. Bill is a long time uh, Canadian umpire, a FISA umpire, and has, and has umpired um, at several coastal events, including the inaugural event held in, uh, in Canada in 2019, and also the World Coastals in 2018. So thanks, Bill, for joining us today. We also have Sarah Pigeon and Aubrey Oldham joining us today. I'm Sarah and Aubrey are longtime uh, successful flatwater rowers and are making the transition to um, uh, making the, made the transition last year actually to um, coastal rowing and were successful. Um, Welcome to and Aubrey, thanks. First of all, um, those of you who joined uh, joined up for the World Rowing uh, Coaches Conference, I hope you had a chance today to watch the Gwyn Batten uh, presentation on coastal beach sprints. It was an excellent presentation that focused on uh, the uh, technicalities of, of beach sprint rowing and also the um, the uh, the skills required to participate in uh, in be uh, description and I think that Aubrey and uh, and Sarah will talk more about the um, the uh, the challenges of of beach sprints and uh, uh, compared to to flat water rowing. So without further ado, we're going to get into, um, Bill Donegan's gonna to talk to us a bit about the practicalities of running uh, a beach sprint event. So over to Bill. Thanks, Peter. It's my privilege to speak to this group and I'm very excited about this topic. The expansion of coastal rowing um, allows for our sport to be practiced in many areas of the world and in, of Canada where flat water just simply isn't available. And of course, the prospect of coastal rowing entering the Olympic program in 2024 will more than likely result in rapid growth and more events in Canada and worldwide. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the sort of practicalities of organizing an event, and I'll focus on four specific topics. One is the field of play. Two is the organizing committee. Three, the volunteer team and for the equipment required. The starting point when talking about any rowing event is you know, the two paramount considerations. One, safety, and two, fairness. They always have to be borne in mind when doing anything around any regatta, and they're very important when looking at, at a coastal event. Coastal presents new challenges to us because it's in open water and you can have variable weather conditions and you always have to be ready for those challenges. Now turning to the field of play, uh, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, a shot that we used for the event in St. Catharines last year. 
And it look, it's a, it's an over. Peter, could you move the slide back, please? Certainly. Yeah. There. Thank you. And and what it shows is is an overview of the basic course layout. And what you will see is um, in the basic course layout is composed of three basic components. One, a run of 50 meters from the start to the boat, a row out 250 meters to a marker, a turning mark boy, and then a row back 250 meters to the beach, and then a run to the finish. And Aubrey and Sarah are gonna tell you more about what that experience is like, but that's the basic concept and layout of a beach sprint course. The start and the finish are usually in the same place and you can make it as complicated as you want to. You can have a simple line in the sand or you can have a, a start line uh, with a, a button set up where the rower will dive and push a button on the ground that will, that will stop the timing and, and determine the winner. The course is two lanes and the event is run knockout style. Now, how you, how you organize the knockout style is open, but the traditional way of doing it is to have a time trial to get to, and the time trial gets the group down to a group of eight, and then a group of eight runs through a series of quarterfinals, semifinals to a final. Uh, the racing, the basic racing model is slalom or straight. And you'll see on the course here, you see the boats will go round the boys and the the, the model adopted in St. Catharines was slalom out and straight back. Now you see that we had the, the, at the turning mark, uh, the boats turned in opposite directions. We set that up in St. Catharines because we were worried about collisions, but the, um, the accepted way of, of doing the turning mark is to have the crews turning in the same direction. The reason for this is that if you have a crosswind, you don't want one crew turning into the wind and the other crew uh, turning with the wind behind them. The picture at the bottom shows the layout in St. Catharines early in the day when the water was, was quite calm. And you see the rowers are rowing out around the buoys. You can see in the distance a launch, uh, which served for safety as well as um, for the turning mark umpire who was ensuring and judging that the uh, boats correctly went around the turning marks. Next slide. The picture on the right is a, a panorama of the field of play. And what you'll see on the extreme right is an arch, which was the start finish line. You will see in the foreground, a number of shells. And this was our boatyard area in the field of play. And then on, on the left-hand side, you see two large triangular boys. They denoted the area where the boats would start. Now, when organizing a regatta, the first thing you need to do is find a beach. And I would say there's five key considerations when finding a beach. One is it needs to be sandy. If the beach is rocky or if there are rocks underwater, they will damage the boats. You need a drop off that is not too steep and not too shallow. Uh, if it's too steep, the, the crews will have trouble getting in and out of the boat. If it's too shallow, the boats will ground too soon before the runners can get out. The uh, weather, the, so first, one, first thing is sandy. Second consideration is drop off. Third consideration is weather. You want a beach that will give you some waves, but not be like a uh, Hawaiian surfer beach, uh, because you've got to find that balance between having enough waves to make it fun and interesting, but not being so rough that you just can't do the regatta. Another one is space. You need a lot of space. You need space to have the start and finish areas, the tents that are involved, and to have the boatyard handy for the start and finish of the race. The final thing is infrastructure, and this is really important. You need to think about parking for people's cars and boat trailers, power, electricity to power up all of your equipment, shelter, 
Uh, is there a picnic pavilion or something like that handy in case you have very bad weather or, or a thunderstorm? Washrooms and changing rooms. Areas for spectators and also having food and water handy. Local approvals are really important and you need to start early on these. Once you've selected your beach, you need to be in contact with the local municipality and get whatever permits are required. The next step would be as well to think about your sanction package, getting your insurance together. Usually the Rowing Canada policy uh, can be used for that and the local municipality may want uh, proof of insurance. Getting your regatta package together with maps of the field of play. Really important thing to think about is equipment and you need to start early on that. Normally in a coastal regatta, the organizing committee supplies the boats. And so it would be the job of the organizing committee to contact either other clubs or boat vendors or someone to supply the boats. So it's important that the boats be uniform of the same type and weight. Otherwise, you will have unfair conditions because some boats are heavier than others um, or of a different design. Uh, think about restrictions. Uh, you know, is there a yacht club nearby? Are there swimmers at the beach? You need to make sure that, that you've got a clear field of play without boats going in and out or swimmers coming in and out. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to give a heads up on is we need rules. We don't have rules in our rules of racing yet. Uh, for the event last year, we drafted our own rules and we based them on the FISA rules. Rules are coming. Uh, the rules of rowing in Canada are now under review and we expect that rules for beach sprints will um, be coming with the new rules. Uh, next slide. The organizing committee is really an important and First, you need a chair uh, or co-chair, but you need a chair to lead the organization. And the earlier you start on this, the better. I would say you should at least start six months uh, before you're gonna begin. You need a chief umpire. You need a safety officer. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of the safety officer. The safety officer is a crucial role. They need to be monitoring the weather, they need to ensure that we have adequate uh, protection on the water for the rowers. We need to be sure that there are adequate contingency plans for events such as fog. I cannot overemphasize the importance of that role. Volunteer coordinator. You do need a fair number of volunteers to run this event on registration, setup and takedown, putting together the infrastructure and the facilities, managing the boatyard, managing uh, the equipment and the like. Um, you need a course manager. The course has to be laid out. It's got to be measured precisely. The boys have to be placed precisely. Very important. Um, finance, always important. You need someone to manage the books. Sponsors, sponsors are great because you know you have to fund the, fund the event and it's tough to fund an event just from entry fees. You really need uh, uh, other sources of funding. And a, a key volunteer is around registration and draw. Um, managing the registrations and getting the draw right and, and managing the draw as it develops through the day through the knockout rounds is a crucial role. Next slide. The team of volunteers and you do need a lot of volunteers to run one of these events. Uh, first you need umpires. You need timers, and there's a photograph of our distinguished timing crew that we had in St. Catharines last year on the right-hand side of the page. Boat handlers are really crucial, and Aubrey and Sarah will talk about uh, them in their presentation, but um, not everyone brings their own boat handlers, so you need people on, on hand to help. Uh, registration, as you know, crucial. Results, uh, getting the results continuously published throughout the day is really important with the, rap the rapid fire and knockout round style of the event. Set up and take down crews. There are tents to be put up. There's a lot of work uh, uh, getting the field of play ready and then taking it down. Safety rescue boats and turning mark boats, very important. Water and food, crucial. 
announcers play a, a special role. Um, once you get into this, you'll see that uh, there's a lot more um, of, a, of a closeness between the spectators and the rowers. And the announcers play a role in introducing the rowers, making it exciting, infusing music into the event that builds excitement and tension and, and uh, creates a really fun atmosphere. This course survey, I, I, I emphasize this because the precision of the placement of the buoys is very important. The rowers want to be sure that they, they're running 50 meters, not 55, and someone else is running 45. The measurement using a surveyor is really important, as well as the spacing of the buoys going out to 250 meters. Uh, practice supervision. Uh, you should allow practice time at the regatta but it has to be supervised and you need to have volunteers on site to log the boats in and out and to observe them while they're training and to make sure the conditions are safe and control the, the environment. Equipment manager, really crucial. Uh, you're going to need a team of volunteers to manage the boats, move them uh, in and out as required for the different races because when you're running a, um, a, a um, a, um, a double and then a solo, you need to switch the boats and you need bodies to pull those boats around and move them into place quickly. Um, awards and prizes, important. Security, very important, especially if the boats are staying overnight. Uh, medical, always important. Social media, that's probably the, the best way to distribute your results efficiently rather than printing and posting on a board. Uh, should have volunteers on top of that, also posting photographs throughout the day. And crowd control, really important. The spectators can be close, but um, you know, you've got to keep them out of the field of play and out of the way of the rowers. Next slide. Equipment, you need lots of stuff, but it's not like setting up a 2000 meter flat water course, nowhere near as complex. And that's the great thing about this, this type of rowing. You need to invest in some marker boys. The large boys shown in the photographs are good. You'll need to have tents there on the day in case it rains to keep all your equipment dry, the registration people dry, the rowers dry. You need lots of chairs. Uh, it's a long day. People need to sit and they get tired. Uh, markers on the shore. Think, don't, don't just think about the markers in the water, but you need markers for the start finish area. You need markers for the 50 meters out that the rowers have to run around to get to the boat. Um, computer hardware, really important for processing your results, your social media. Uh, start and finish installation. You can, as I said, you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want um, using the buttons or just using a line in the sand. Um, food and water, crucial getting the boats. I've already talked about that. That's really important. Uh, putting the results together. Uh, we developed a special result sheet uh, so that we could log the time, the penalties that might have been assessed, and uh, the placings. Uh, a timing system, again, can be as simple as, as we used in St. Catharines, three coaches with stopwatches, or you can use computerized with the buttons. Um, Umpire and safety boats, obviously important. Radios, rakes was something that, that we uh, didn't think about in St. Catharines, but realized were important halfway through the day and got them because the sand gets pretty beaten up by the people running back and forth. Um, and I just want to finish uh, the discussion with the words that I basically started with and the paramount thing when organizing any event and a beach event or any event is safety and fairness. And if you keep those uh, considerations front of mind, you will have a good event. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Bill. And now we'll move on to Sarah and Aubrey from the athlete's perspective. All right, thanks, Peter. So Aubrey and I are gonna start by going through the various aspects of the race. So the pre-race looks a bit different for beach sprints than it does for flat water rowing. You're still responsible for making sure your boat and equipment is ready for racing. 
But since the boats are provided by the regatta and shared amongst all the competitors, most of the rigging aspects have to remain the same between the crews. Typically, four boats are used for racing and rotated through the various races. Approximately 10 minutes before your race, the crew will get access to the boat and be able to adjust the footstocks, the slides, oarlock heights, and put in their oars. That's about the only things you're allowed to adjust to the boat. Um, the oars may or may not be provided by the regatta, but if they are, you also have the option of bringing your own, which allows you to set them to the length that you want. At one minute before the start, the umpire will ask the crews to put their boats in the water. At this point, the runner heads to the start line while the boat handlers and any non-running crew members put the boat in the water and prepare it for the start. Next slide. All right, let's talk about the start here. Once you've done your equipment check and any other pre-race rituals, you'll make your way to the start area. So before you do that, remember that this is actually a beach sprint, as you see in this picture. You don't start in the boat. The start line is on the land in the beach. This is not, sorry, this is not a quiet reflection time before the start that you're used to lining up on the water. Drawing you into the excitement is a crowd right there on the beach. And depending on the events, cameras and microphones in your face, just as you are stealing yourself to get ready for the sprint. One member of the crew, the runner, you in this case, are standing on the start line. The rest of the crew are at the boat getting ready. With a minute to go, the music stops. This is when the crew and boat handlers get the boat to the water, as Sarah just said, and you are on the line ready to bolt. We see this exact time in the image here. Just like on the water, when the signal goes, you start, except here you are running full sprint up to 50 meters down the beach. At the World Finals in China last year, the beach was pretty steep, which added a whole level of challenge for everyone who hadn't been training there. Next slide. The transition into the boat is the most important aspect of the race in terms of the time that can be lost if it's not done well. I would say the transition is usually what differentiated the winning crews from the rest of the crews. So the non-running rowers, um, as Aubrey mentioned, start in the water next to the boat and they can climb into the boat as soon as they, they hear the start signal. For boat handlers, you're allowed two boat handlers per crew, but the organizing committee may allow up to three boat handlers at their discretion, depending on the venue and the conditions. So far, every international beach sprint event has allowed three boat handlers per crew. And your boat handlers play a really important role. They're like, your pit crew. So you don't want to just grab a couple of random spectators off the beach and ask them to hold your boat. It's really important to practice these transitions with your handlers and establish clear roles so every person knows exactly where to stand, what to hold, and when to push. And it might sound really obvious, but your boat handlers are also there to help keep the boat straight and make sure that they're pushing the boat in the right direction so that you don't have to make steering adjustments right from the first stroke. The boats don't have starting blocks like they would in flat water rowing. So the boats do have to start in general alignment with the lane buoys, but it's actually up to the crew and the boat handlers to decide how far offshore or close to the beach they want to hold the boat. Obviously, the farther offshore you start, the farther you have to run and the deeper the water will get, which slows you down. Typically, crews opt to hold the boats as close as possible to the shore without running the fin into the sand. And just a note on boat design, this can affect how you get in and out of the boat in terms of whether it has bow or stern mounted riggers. We definitely learned this the hard way um, when we were training in Canada using coastal boats with stern mounted riggers only to arrive in China and realize that we'd be racing in boats with bow mounted riggers. So in this picture, um, you can see Aubrey and Darcy, Darcy practicing their transition into the boat before racing in China. And the boat has bow mounted riggers. So the boat handlers are holding 
Darcy's oar handles out of the way as she climbs into the boat. And she's climbing in from the stern, stepping over the footstops. Next slide. The water section of the event accounts for about 85% of the race distance, which the rowers must cover at sprinting speeds. In doing this, you will first have to overcome the breaking waves close to shore, and then the churn of the swells crossing through each crest and trough towards that turn buoy. As rowers, we're so used to looking 2,000, 1,000 meters down the course. For me, coming into this from flat water perspective, the buoys being so close together really made this event feel manageable. Only 80, 85 meters between the buoys, but as with any shorter race, the effort and accompanying pain is simply more condensed. Those first strokes of your race, you will be pushing directly over and through the breaking waves. It is easy to lose a seat in this section as your bow lifts and crashes down. Once clear of the breaking waves, you've already approached the first, you're already approaching the first buoy. Assisting here again, your onshore team can help with direction. This image shows a boat handler using hand signals to direct their rower. On this course, you'll be swallowing around the first two boys, as Bill described. Having been partnered with my twin in the pair in our first years of racing, I personally have had plenty of experience swallowing a course, so was happy to finally have the opportunity to have it count. As long as your boat travels around the proper side of the buoy, you can get as close to it as you like, even knocking it over with your rigor. But there are heavy penalties for missing a buoy. Next slide. The turn is the second most important aspect of the race. Again, a lot of time can be lost here if the turn is not done well. And turns are something we practice a lot before competing in China, and we knew it was a really important aspect of the race, but even still, we found ourselves losing time on the turn compared to our competitors. So you wanna make sure your turns are as tight to the buoy as possible. Luckily, coastal boats do turn quite a bit faster than flat water rowing shells. The fastest crews can typically do this turn in about eight to 10 seconds. Um, something to keep in mind, the buoy itself is quite large. It's about 50 to 100 centimeters in diameter and at least a meter tall. You have to go around the buoy in the proper direction or you'll incur a 60 second penalty. And crews should definitely practice turns in both directions at full race pace and in a variety of different conditions from flat water to very large rolling waves. Some important race considerations for the turn, your oars do take considerable load when turning at race pace, particularly in the mixed quad event. So something to keep in mind when you're choosing your equipment, if you're bringing oars. Another consideration for race organizers, and Bill did touch on this, is to set up the course to have both lanes turning in the same direction. It just gives fairer conditions in the event of a crosswind. And I guess that just as a, another note, all international beach sprint events so far have implemented a turn to port side for both lanes. Uh, so next slide. Once you do turn around that farthest buoy and make your way back to the beach, you have to consider the conditions in the wind. Which direction is the wind coming from? What about the waves? Where's the marker flag on the beach? Well, we didn't end up in the final, with the final overall result that we wanted. This picture of the mixed double with Darcy from our quarterfinals finals captures a race we are proud to finish. We are hitting the beach just ahead of the Spanish. You can see in the background. I'm getting ready to jump out of the boat. We won this race and are really proud of it, but it really could have gone either way. After we made the turn, we were neck and neck with the Spanish, but early into our return trip, we were swamped by a wave. It felt like it just stopped us and left us trailing by more than a length, which in an elimination duel with less than 200 meters to go feels like 10 lengths. We had really never discussed what we would do in this situation but both knew that if this was how we were gonna end our worlds, we were gonna finish going 100% even from behind. But then with 20 strokes to go, the Spanish also got swamped. And for a brief time, we were able to ride that wave and ended up, as you see here, inches ahead of the beach. The lesson here 
is the race course and the beach are always dynamic. One wave can make a difference and the importance of staying focused in the boat and on your own performance and working through whatever comes one wave at a time, one stroke at a time is just as important as it is in the multi-lane flat water rowing we know so well. Next slide. For the transition out of the boat, the first step is obviously beaching the boat. It sounds pretty straightforward. You just row the boat right up onto the beach, but you need to be careful as you approach the beach that the stern of your boat is not riding on the crest of a wave, which tilts the bow of the boat down. This will cause your boat to nosedive into the beach and could cause injury or damage to the boat. Our Canadian mixed squad learned this the hard way in China. We were rowing flat out for the beach, practicing a transition out of the boat. It was high tide that day, meaning the water was a lot deeper and the beach was steeper at the water's edge. As we approached the beach at full speed, our stern was riding on the crest of a very large wave and this forced our bow down and we did a nose dive into the sand instead of riding our boat smoothly up the beach slope. As a result, all of our crew members were flung backwards off our seats with our feet in the air and all of our competitors watching. Thankfully, this lesson was learned during practice and not during racing. The next step is the dismount. One crew member, which is typically gonna be your bow seat, has to jump out of the boat and run up the beach to the finish line. Your boat handlers are still there and can help catch the boat when it lands on the beach. More importantly, they can also help direct the runner around the flag as they run up the beach. This is important as it can be really disorienting for the runner to get their bearings when they jump out of the boat. And a safety consideration for this aspect of the race is for rowers to ensure that their boat is perpendicular to the waves when re-entering the surf zone. The surf zone is the shallower area near the beach where the waves start to break. Within this zone, boats can easily get turned parallel to the beach and result in dangerous conditions for the runner if the waves throw the boat onto them as they step out. Next slide. At this point, it doesn't matter how you exited from the boat. You just have to run to the finish. As the finish runner, you need to flip your bearings from going backwards to running forwards. And this mirror flip is made harder by your exhaustion. As Sarah mentioned, the boat handlers will be there at the flag to make sure you go the right direction. The race isn't over till you're over that line. Having only done a handful of these so far, I haven't yet experienced that head-to-head -head intensity on the beach, but races can be won and lost in these last seconds. When you get out of the boat, your legs are so full of lactic acid and it feels like getting off the erg after a 2K and running a sprint. It's impossible to get the speed you want. You just have to push to get up the beach, watching that you keep as steady as you can. Here we see Sarah reaching for the finished buzzer at Worlds. In the background, you can also see the flag that she had to run around. Next slide. So something to keep in mind for beach sprints that's different from flat water rowing is you have to do an entirely on land warm up before your race. So this is gonna be predominantly erging and running. And it's something to note for race organizers too, that it's a good idea to have ergs available for rowers to warm up. The racing format, as Bill already mentioned, is head to head racing. Um, so it's gonna consist of a time trial, which then seeds crews into a knockout bracket and also repressages if necessary. You can expect to do three to four rounds of back-to-back -back racing per event with often little recovery time between races. At the extreme end of things, this can mean less than 10 minutes between races. So this happened to our Canadian mixed double at Worlds. Aubrey and Darcy raced in the second of two semifinals in a really close race and unfortunately lost. This meant that they had to race in the B final, which was the very next race. Races were running at seven minute centers and their semifinal race took them about two and a half minutes to complete, meaning that upon finishing, they had only four and a half minutes before their B final race started. On top of this, they were notified that they would have to switch lanes for the B final. While exhausted and still trying to catch their breath, they had approximately one and a half minutes to take their oars out of the boat they had just raced in lane one, move them over to the boat 
in lane two, as well as adjust their foot stops and slides all before they were called forward for their flash inter interview with three minutes to go to the start. This makes for a very fast paced and hectic racing format, which athletes need to be prepared for both mentally and physically. So as I mentioned, you can expect to be changing boats and lanes between races. Faster crews from the faster crew from the previous round gets to choose their lane for each race. In the event of a race between a crew that advanced directly from a time trial going up against a crew that raced through a repechage, the crew that plays higher in the time trial has priority in selecting the lane. And again, you only get access to your boat about 10 minutes before your race. Flash interviews were something that we weren't expecting when we raced in China. World Rowing implemented this to help engage the audience and make the, the sport more spectator friendly. So three minutes before the start of a race, crews were called to the center of the beach and introduced to the crowd by the race commentators, similar to what you'd expect at a track and field event. Each crew was then asked one question by the commentator in a flash interview format and finished in time for the one minute before the race mark. Next slide. As Peter alluded to um, Gwen Batten's discussion this morning on beach sprint rowing, um, which I also fully recommend everyone watch if they are able to, she drew a parallel between rowing and cycling that I feel really helps capture this growing discipline within our sport. Lane racing in many ways is like track cycling where coastal rowing is similar to mountain biking. And within the beach sprint rowing, within that beach sprint rowing can be seen alongside downhill mountain biking. The main takeaway about coastal rowing for me from this is, as Gwyn put it, the field of play is highly variable from race to race. Crews adapt to the field of play rather than the field of play being controlled. This is the beauty of beach sprint rowing. It is dynamic. It is rowing, it is coastal rowing, but it is also a unique sport and should be considered such when looking to training. Given this, there are still some standard measurements that should cross over to the shorter distance. The key elements that are necessary for longer distance rowing training are applicable. It seems to me that you will need a good aerobic base to be able to do these races back to back. And that said, for each individual race, you will need to put on the power. Training needs to look at sports specific skills on the beach, in the transition and on the water. Training can be split between rowing, running, strength training, boat handling skills, including transitions, turning. On the erg, max power, one minute, 500 meters, 1,000 meter pieces are more likely better performance indicators than 2,000 and 6,000 meter pieces. On the water, rowers must practice turns and transitions in the coastal boat as much as possible in various conditions. Practice with a boat handling team who will need to perform a specific and essential skill. Beach sprint rowers will need to practice running in the sand on the beach, eventually adding in sprint work in the sand. Strength and conditioning will also play a large role in this explosive sport. This will assist in the sprint on land, the shorter distance on the water, and the dynamic nature of coastal rowing. Athletes, um, if available, should practice on the ocean in different conditions, on lakes where the ocean is not available, in different tides, large waves, as well as flat water. Learn to, learn to be ready to ride the waves when you can and to row against and with them. For rowers who are only familiar with fresh water, who is most of Canadian rowers, I believe, you have to be prepared to row in salt water. If you're not used to it, rowing in salt water, your hands will need time to adjust. You must find and train on a similar beach to the one you'll be racing on. Athlete health is also very important to consider as in all sports uh, and will be a key aspect of your training. Physically and psychologically, nutrition, sleep, mental health are all important considerations. Having said all of this, we do not know what beach sprint training will become. And that's part of the fun. Right now, there are no biomechanical studies on beach sprint rowers. There are no established testing metrics, no gold medal standards. There are, however, opportunities to establish these through trial and error, hard work, and time on the beach, in the waves, and in the gym. Back to Peter. 
Great. Thank you very much to all of our presenters. That was, uh, that was excellent. And um, I think right now we'll, we do have some questions that I would ask all of uh, the participants. If you have questions, please to send them in. Uh, but before we get to that, I think we'll just spend a few moments on discussing uh, where is coastal rowing going in Canada. And we'll particularly focus on uh, the coastal beach sprints. And there are a number of events planned for 2021. They were also planned for 2020, but un unfortunately due to the pandemic, uh, they couldn't be held. And we're hoping they will be held in, in 2021. And more information will be coming on that uh, in the near future. Also, um, many of you are aware that at the 2020 World Rowing Extraordinary Congress, uh, the members voted to propose to the International Olympic Committee to include three coastal rowing events at the 2024 Paris Olympic Games as part of the um, rowing program. The three events that are being proposed to the IOC are the coastal mixed double, the coastal women's solo, and the coastal men's solo. The IOC will be meeting very shortly to make a decision on the proposed Olympic rowing program. Um, and we hope to know that uh, within the next couple of weeks. However, um, with Paris 2024 facing financial challenges raised by the COVID pandemic, it's not known at this time whether even if the IOC does approve the Olympic program, a rowing program that includes coastal events, whether um, coastal will be included in Paris 2024. So let's cross our fingers um, and hope that it is included. It's also not known that uh, whether it will be the endurance version of coastal rowing or the beach sprint version. And that still will be decided when, uh, when the decision about whether it's to be included in the Olympics uh, is, 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 uh, is known. So um, those are some uh, important points. And, and uh, we do have some questions, which I will um, now um, address with um, our participants. And this one is from Walter Martindale. Um, and in the presentation of, by World Rowing, they showed course buoys that were small enough that they could be rowed over by the rigger or oar while still making a slalom, like you see with ski slalom, where they hit the flags down. The buoys in our images uh, from our presentation uh, look too big for that. Is that intentional? And I'll answer that first, um, uh, uh, Mark, uh, Walter, and then uh, maybe our panelists will join in as well. And, and certainly the, when, we, um, when we were organizing the event in 2019, we did order buoys based on um, some previous events that had uh, occurred. And so we didn't really have a, a large information on, a lot of information on the dimensions, uh, but we had to have something that we felt would be, um, would hold up in the conditions depending on, on how rough they got. What you see now in most events is you see the cigar shaped buoys, which you saw in, in the presentation this morning. And I think in the future, we will move to the cigar shaped buoys um, that will allow um, the crews to row over them and then they'll go down and then be able to pop back up again um, when, um, uh, when the crew is passed. Obviously they have to be robust enough to take a, the hammering of a boat or a, an oar into it. So that's one consideration of course, and also be strong enough that they can be weighted down and held um, um, down in the movement of tide or waves. Um, so that's uh, hopefully a good answer to that one, but I'll ask our panelists uh, to offer any information if you, if you have anything further to add. Hey, uh, Peter. I yep. would just add that the boys need to be large enough to be seen clearly uh, from the shore by the spectators, because one of the really exciting things about this is the that the spectator standing on the beach can Unlike in flat water rowing, the spectator at the beach can see the whole race. And uh, it's really important for them to be able to see the boy well enough so that they can see the boats going around and coming back. The other thing is that in rough water, um, you need a boy that's tall because they're not visible if the waves are high. They'll disappear, they'll, they'll come up and down. So those are just two factors around, around boys. Great, thanks. And there's another further comment from John Easton who um, indicates that if you roll over the, over the uh, buoys and you have a bow mounted rigger, not really an issue, but with stern mounted, rigger, rig, stern mounted riggers, you could potentially have a, a, a situation where the, where the buoy might get caught in the, between the rigger and the, um, and the athlete. So that's another consideration. So um, again, um, those are good points. And again, thank as the sport evolves, there'll be a certain standardization of, of everything. I think there is a lot already. Um, but um, those are certainly some considerations. There's another good question from Ryan Slate. Um, is there a manufacturer of coastal boats in Canada? 
And if so, are the coastal boats comparable in price to flat water shells? And again, I'll start with, uh, with this, um, and then I'll ask our panelists to join in as well. Um, I am not aware of any manufacturers in Canada for coastal equipment. Uh, but I do know there are a boat, light boat, which is also French, um, and also Swift, um, which um, is another good version of coastal boats, and Felipe. So those are the four that I'm aware of, and they are distributed. They are distributors in Canada for the, those that that equipment. Um, and if you do need that information, we can provide that. Ryan, you can send us a question if you or a note if you would like the information on who the distributors are, and we can get that to you. And I'll ask our panelists to um, uh, join in with any other further information if you have any. Uh, in addition to that, I know that there is um, an up and coming American manufacturer out of Massachusetts, Rebel Rowing, which um, is producing in development right now and um, they're going to be out in the next year or two. So there is an option there as well. Great. Um, we'll just hang on for one more minute to see if there's any further questions. I know there's, uh, I think we've answered all the questions so far that I see. Uh, we have one more here. We have from Francie Schweitzer. Uh, I missed where you, we could watch past coastal rowing events. Could you suggest a site or sites to view? I think I'll pass this off to Aubrey and Sarah. I know you've watched a lot of the video on uh, and, and sites for it. Perhaps you could pass on uh, some locations where people might be able to find um, this type of video. Uh, I'm the one I'm muted right now, so I guess I'll go. Um, in searching for a lot of video, it seems in the last year there's been a, a big influx of video because of the, the uh, worlds and then more recently the European Coastal Challenge included beach sprints and that was just in Italy last month. Um, so those videos are up on YouTube right now. So if you just do a basic Google search for coastal rowing beach sprints, you should be able to find quite a bit of race footage. The, the entirety of the European as well as the world beach sprint finals from last year are online and available, uh, as well as uh, a bunch of other video footage. FISA itself has some of this footage on its sites as well. Great, thank you. We have one further question from Barb Groot from the United States. How do you determine if the SERP is too rough to be safe? And I'll ask Bill to comment first on this. Yeah, hi, Barb, thanks for joining us. A um, Couple of things, first of all, uh, in England last year, as I, I, I was advised, they had to cancel the event because they had extremely high waves. Like if, if you saw from uh, the photos that Aubrey and uh, Sarah were discussing, there's quite a bit of the waves breaking on the beach caused the bow of the boat to go way up in the air. And you know, you can reach a point where the waves are such that you just can't launch the boats and can't practically do the event. And in fact, it could become dangerous. Um, and then the other, so that's a big consideration. You know, you've got it. And then the other thing was, I know when we were setting up uh, we ran a, an open water coastal event in Toronto uh, about uh, three years ago, and the city in their permitting uh, advised us that if the wind goes uh, above a certain speed, we would have to call the event. So there may well be local regulations that would deal with that as well. So there's the practical thing about the waves being too, too high to practically launch the boats, and also there may be uh, local restrictions as a result of uh, permitting. Great. Anything further to add, Sarah or Aubrey? What we do know, I think that also that um, when the meet, when the waves get above one meter in height, I think that's when there's you know certain safety considerations come into play. So, um, and that's a, a call by the obviously by the chief umpire. But um, uh, it's a very good question, Barb, and will um, certainly something to to um, to address further on and as uh, as coastal rowing gets more established. There's an excellent question by Peter Deneu. Uh, what about injuries to athletes between races? Are substitutions allowed? Peter, do you want me to- uh, Sure, Bill, yeah. Bill that? Well, the normal, uh, in Canadian rowing anyway, uh, 
the Canadian rules of rowing uh, substitution rules apply here. And um, uh, rule 7.6 deals with uh, substitutions before the first heat and 7.7 .7 deals with crew changes after the first heat. And crew changes uh, are permitted in the event of injury with some form of medical certification. So the answer to that is if there is an injury, a substitution would be permitted um, and so, uh, based on and subject to uh, uh, the rules of racing. It's a very good question, as, as Aubrey and Sarah both mentioned, that the time between heats and, and uh, our, our quarterfinals and semifinals and finals can be very tight. So um, to substitute an athlete in at that time would be challenging. Uh, but uh, certainly, as Bill says, the rules of racing do apply to that. We have a question from Nancy Stores. Can you explain about endurance coastal racing? And I think what Nancy means by that is the difference between um, a uh, beach sprint, which is basically 250 meters out and 250 meters in and endurance rowing, which was the event that was held in Victoria in Canada in 2018, which is effectively between uh, four to six kilometers where you're rowing offshore around a course and then back in. Um, so I think uh, those are the two different types of, of, or two different versions of coastal rowing. And Aubrey, you might have more to say about, because I know you've, uh, you've discussed or thought about both. Yeah, last year I had the, um... The, the great uh, sort of experience being able to do both the um, sprint and the endurance formats back to back in um, China and then in Hong Kong for the coastal uh, endurance event. Um, like the sort of um, analogy which uh, Gwyn presented in hers and I represented in ours about, about cycling, the endurance is like the longer format mountain biking. So you get the waves, you get the churning, you get that experience in the water in rough conditions, but it's for a longer endurance period. So the race is between 4K and 6K in distance, depending on the, the heats and the finals. It's a mass start similar to sailing. So it's very exciting that the boat's jostling behind the line. You can uh, take the line at a run um, if you are so inclined. Uh, it's, it's very engaging with the mass start. Everyone's going for that first buoy. There's um, a number of buoys they have to turn in the course before they come back to the finish line. Um, there's other events. If people were thinking about videos of this, there's um, probably one of the more famous coastal events is the Prince Albert Challenge um, endurance race in Monaco. Um, Gwyn mentioned in the comments here. Um, that's definitely one I personally want to try and race at one point. The um, Worlds, when it was in BC, was the endurance format. This has a much longer history than beach sprints itself. It goes back um, over a decade. They've held world championships for the longer format. And yeah, it can be very exciting as beach sprints. It's just a, a little bit more rowing involved. Hey, Peter, could I... Can I add, we, we, we organized two um, uh, of the endurance coastal events in Toronto about one, four and one, five years ago. And uh, they were really fun to do. We, we set up a three kilometer course in Lake Ontario and uh, started it at the beach at the beaches area of Toronto. And uh, it was a very successful day and we really enjoyed it. So we can organize uh, both forms in Ontario and and uh, I think run them successfully. Great, thank you. We have another question from Cinda Uten. What have you experienced or learned in rigging for beach sprints versus the longer endurance events? And I'll, I'll pass this to Aubrey and Sarah and I'll provide a few comments myself at the end. Sarah, would you like to start with this one? Sure. So I think there's still a lot to learn uh, in terms of coastal rowing and, you know, things like rigging. So I don't really have um, an exact answer. One thing I will say is for the beach sprints, at least, I've never done the endurance event, but all the crews are typically rating quite high. Like you can expect to be rating about 40 strokes a minute for the entire race. Um, so I think in general, you want to rig yourself a, a little bit lighter um, in terms of the length of the oars. Uh, that's probably the only comment that I have. 
could I just chip in on this? Uh, one of the interesting things about these boats is that the riggers move up and down. <laughs> in they're hinged and they go up and down in the waves, so your your height can can be varying on you while you're rowing. That um, just to to touch on that that um, that's the case in some coastal boats, not all boats have that ability. So it is it is um, a feature of some of them. Um, I know that the boats that we used last year, the Philippines did not have that feature, um, nor do the, at least the solo light boats right now, but uh, that is definitely something that's in some of some of them. Um, I just want to mention a comment that uh, Gwyn added. Gwyn's giving us some uh, FISA input here in our, our chat. Um, she's saying that the, the rig, for the beach sprint is a standard rig. So the coaches aren't actually allowed to change anything and the athletes cannot change the span. You can't change anything major on the boat because it's just such a quick turnover. So I believe it's 160 across for that. You're, you're stuck at that. You can adjust the footboards. You can adjust your oars. As Sarah said, everyone's rating over 40. So obviously with the heavier boat, we're gonna be lightening the oars up. Shorter, a little shorter oars, much lighter on the inboard just to be able to wind it up and get that boat moving. And, and Cindy, just to further some information on that, there there is a planned uh, coastal module ro racing coasting coastal racing module um, planned for the Rowing Canada conference in January. And I think there'll be more information coming out about rigging during that session. So that's a little uh, pump up for that. So uh, I think you might be interested. Many coaches might be interested in joining that uh, at the session in in, in January. Uh, we have we have time for about three more questions of former we have quite a few coming in here so this next question again is from uh, it's directed to the athletes from barb groot again thank you barb um, athletes which do you find more challenging leaving the beach or coming back in um that's an interesting question uh i would say getting getting into the boat is more challenging than getting out of the boat. But in terms of the actual um, on water conditions, coming back into the beach is actually a lot harder than it looks to do it um, safely, I guess. You really have to be able to read the waves and react if necessary, if, if the surf is quite large. I would agree with Sarah there. I think. Um, it actually it looks easier coming in just when the athletes do it well. Um, getting into the boat is tricky. There's um, the wave you have to worry about. At one of my races, I had to stop and wait for the, the breaker to come underneath of the boat before I could get in, um, just or else the boat would have been, been at 90 degrees or 45 degrees in the air. Um, so there are a lot of considerations. But again, your, your team is holding the boat as stable as they can. You're going through something that hopefully you've trained over and over again. When you're coming in to the beach, the wave could push you away, which you're just not expecting at that time. So it feels, um, even with our limited experience doing this, for both of us have experience going in and out of the boat, um, it does feel like you're sort of hoping that you're going to hit the right wave at the right time on the way in to be able to control it. So there is that very dynamic element involved in coming in, which is sort of controlled by the aspect that you have people holding the boat, managing things for you when you are entering the boat, which is still tricky though, too. Great. Thank you. We have another question from Anik van Leeuwen. This might be our last question um, because we're running out of time. If you're from a non-coastal province, are there options to participate in any events, i.e. are there beginner or novice events? And I'll speak to this a little bit first. Um, in 2021, there are planned a number of events. Um, most of them will be um, uh, spread across, well, the only four events actually, they're spread a little bit across the country, but not every province will be um, we'll have them in 2021. They are, it's a kind of a pilot series. Um, but each of the events that will be planned, there'll be more information coming on this soon. Each of the events um, does have a come and try it, a component to it. So they have uh, a timing before the event where, at, where participants or, or people interested or, or athletes interested in it can come and try it, get out in a coastal boat, go around the buoys, um, will there be safety boats and et cetera on the water just to ensure that um, it, it has a chance to be um, uh, 
basically broaden the reach of, of coastal rowing within Canada. So that will be coming and hopefully Monique, that answers you a bit of your question, but there'll be more information coming out on that soon. Um, I'm gonna ask Andrew if we have a couple more time for a couple more questions. We have some more coming in here and I'm trying to get to them as quick as we can. Um, but if not, we will move on, but I just, um, I want, I'm going to see if we can get a little bit more time to uh, answer some questions. I'm just trying to get Andrew, here. Uh, it's Andrew, yep. you, you can, um, if everyone's okay with staying, these are great questions, absolutely. Great, thank you. So we have a few more questions here. Um, this is from Peter Walsh. Do you position your crew runner strategically in the boat, in the bow or the stern? So yes, I think uh, the runner that is starting the race, you typically want that runner to be in the stern of the boat so they have the shortest distance to run and get in the boat easily. The runner at the end of the race, you typically want them to be in bow seat. So again, they have the shortest distance from the boat to the finish line. Great, and I guess they don't have to jump over any oars if they're in, uh, if they're in bow seat jumping out of the boat. Yes, that as well. Yeah, uh, if I can add to that, um, a point of sort of interest is that when we arrived in, in um, China last year, it felt like everyone, including us, was new to the sport. Um, it is big in Europe, coastal rowing in general and offshore rowing. So they're a lot more familiar with the equipment with rowing on the waves, but still new to this format. It's only been around for a few years. We got there and the, the Chinese team had been training at this site for months, um, their entire team practicing on that beach in those conditions with the, the buoys, with the course laid out. These um, athletes were very, very trained um, for this race, um, much more than we possibly could have been training with uh, coastal boats that we found dusty in some clubs. Um, to be ready for. Uh, one story which I heard um, from someone was that the Chinese went through 200 people to find their coxie. They found the one that could run the fastest to the boat. And it is the coxie in the quad, 200 to get someone. And they taught them how to cox and steer around the buoy. Um, if you watch the video of the races, do watch the Chinese. They swept the events. The only event they didn't win was the men's solo. And there were some some reasons why it's possible um the the winner was extremely very good and he went on to win the the endurance event the next weekend um but the chinese got silver and three gold medals at that event so they were definitely trying to show a statement there and that's the bar right now so we have to step up to that in order to be successful moving forward well, great. Thank you very much, panelists. That was, uh, that was excellent. And I appreciate uh, all of that great information you provided. And then just one final comment from, um, from Beatrice in PEI. She says, if you want to try Coastal Rowan, come and try it in PEI. So great. Thank you to everyone. And uh, again, thank you for joining us and, and for joining us on, the, on this um, Rowan Virtual Coaches Conference. Uh, appreciate it and hope you enjoy uh, the, the other sessions coming up uh, in the next few days. Thank you again.